Welcome back to the Airport Explorers Club Virtual Camp. Uh, we're so excited uh, you're here. Um, today we're wrapping up our fall October camps uh, with an amazing presentation on the future of aviation. Uh, but don't worry, Airport Explorers, we'll be back again with more exciting camps in November. And our next camp will be on Thursday, November 18th. And we're changing our camp start time to 3.30 so more explorers can join us after school. So remember to check our website and register for our next uh, three camps. Um, I'll be giving you more information later on in, the, in a couple of minutes. So before we move along, let's say hi to a few of my friends who will be helping me again today. Um, as you know, my name is Catherine. I'm the one on the left and I'm your host today. And I have the, I'm really happy to be working at Toronto Pearson um, Airport. And I have a great uh, job of just going out and meeting with the community and talking about all the great things we do at the airport. And to my right is Kathy. And Kathy, you want to introduce yourself to our explorers? Hi, everybody. I'm virtually waving to you all and welcome airport explorers. My name is Kathy and I work with an amazing team like Catherine said, and my job is to work on programs such as the Pearson Airport Explorers Camp and to sort of tell you and the community around the airport of all the great things that happen at Toronto Pearson Airport. And now I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Hies, who's just below Catherine there. Hies, can you tell air our airport explorers what you do? Hey, good afternoon, Airport Explorers. I'm Case. So I work in the Noise Management Office. Um, I've been lucky enough to have been with uh, Toronto Pearson for about five years now. Um, and uh, me and the team really try and make the flight operations at Toronto Pearson as quiet as possible for our neighbours around the airport. Russ, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi there, explorers. I'm, um, I'm the lucky guy who gets to go out and about and see things. So normally I'm out on the airfield today. I'm going to be coming at you from the community instead. And I get to work with these lovely people and we have lots of fun together. Yeah, we sure do. And um, I hope our explorers can you know, see how much fun we have and, and, and start to look at ways that they can get educated to start working and you know, looking for opportunities to work at the airport. So um, before we move along, I'm going to leave this slide up a little bit longer so you can write down our email address and website. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, uh, you can sign up to become an official Pearson Airport Explorers Club member. Um, and as a member, we'll provide you with more fun activities and inside information each week. So make sure you visit our website at airportexplorer.club uh, to learn more. Um, so, um, and then we'll put this up later on uh, again, if you can't write it down now. Um, but the reason I'm asking you to write down this uh, information is that we'll also be giving you a special activity at the end of our camp today that we'll ask you to complete and send to us. So, Kathy, can you tell our airport explorers why it's a good idea for them to send in their work? Absolutely, Catherine. By sending us your work, so airport explorers, send your work to traffic control at airportexplorer.club before October 28th, and your name will be put into a draw to win some cool prizes such as Airport Explorer Club hats, t-shirts or jigsaw puzzles. And if you've joined us each week and sent in all three of the activities that we've assigned, your name will be put into a draw for a special chance to win one of three amazing Chromebooks. The draw for the Chromebook will be on October 30th and we will mail the three lucky winners of the Chromebook draw shortly after that. We will also be contacting all our winners of hats, t-shirts and jigsaw puzzles. So make sure to remember to send in your work. Catherine, can you tell our airport explorers what activity was, uh, what activity we did last week? Oh yeah, sure, Kathy. That's a great idea. Um, in our uh, last episode, which was on cargo and baggage, uh, we introduced a game called Cargo Bingo. So um, our explorers were asked to complete with their family and friends, compete with their family and friends to find objects that matched the dis uh, descriptions on the Cargo Bingo card. And the first one to yell, Cargo wins. So if you weren't able to join us last week, you can still play the game. Uh, just watch last week's camp on our website and you'll find more cool stuff um, we looked at as well as the, the game we played. And and Kathy, I know you have a cool activity planned for us again today, don't you? I do. I always have a cool activity. Everybody who's joined me, I hope you enjoy our activities, but I have a really pretty cool activity today. And he Ace, can you tell our airport explorers what else they can find on our Airport Explorers Club website? 
Cargo. Oh, I mean, sure, I can <laughs> happy. Uh, there's a lot of cool things on our website, airportexplorer.club. You'll find lots of activities such as how to decode messages using the aviation phonetic alphabet. We have mazes and games that you can play. And of course, the instructions to help you build your own plane or even a kite. And we have some interviews in our airtime section with a pilot, an astronaut, and a few of the people who work at Toronto Pearson. So to be sure to check that out. Uh, our October camps were also recorded as we're doing today. So you can always find them online. And don't forget to tell your friends and family that they can watch our camps as well. Terrific. And uh, thanks, Yace, for all this important information. Uh, so before Yace takes us through the, the, the presentation on the future of aviation, I'm just going to let you know uh, how today's camp will roll out. So first off, as I said, we're going to take a we're take, take a look at the slide, the future of aviation. Make sure you pay attention to some extra inside information and some clues we'll be giving you that that'll help you later when we play our trivia. And then we're going to talk to uh, see what Russ was up to today, our roving reporter. Um, he's going to take us to re two really cool parks to talk about the history of aviation. Uh, next, uh, Kathy and I are going to play some trivia. So again, remember to play, uh, pay attention to some of the hints Yace and I will be giving as we go through the presentation. And later, uh, when we see what Russ has to say when he's in the parks in Mississauga. And then after trivia, we're going to talk to Russ about some of the questions that came in after last camp. So unfortunately, because we have so much to cover in the one hour we're together, we won't have time to answer any of the questions that come into the chat box. But you can send us your questions after the camp when you submit our work, and then we'll look at those uh, when we meet again in November. Uh, we'll end our time together with Kathy, who will walk us through the activity you can have fun with after this camp. So remember to do the activity and send us a picture um, of your work to be eligible to win some cool prizes. So I just want to know, Hayes, are you ready yes, to go? Catherine. Roger that, Catherine. Airport Explorers, let's go. So today's presentation is really all about the future of aviation, how air travel and aviation has evolved, and really what changes are being made at the airport right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we've learned a lot about airplanes and airports and, and how they've changed over the last century, but how will air travel and aviation change in the future? Uh, we've got some very excited, exciting ideas about that, so let's go and check them out. I'm always interested in seeing what's happening in the future. I know, and there's some, some really cool futuristic stuff ahead, Catherine. So some of the changes that are happening right now at the airport, uh, you're going to see next time, hopefully, that you're uh, going to be able to get on a plane again and fly somewhere exciting. Uh, the changes that are being made right now are due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of that, the airport is creating new ways for passengers to really fly safely through the airport. Hmm. So a big example of that is Toronto Pearson Airport's new program that's called Healthy Airport. So there's a lot of cleaning going on. We're wiping down everything people touch. And we even have really cool robots that help us to clean the floors. Uh, of course, physical distancing is really important so people can stay two meters apart from one another. And everyone in the airport is required and must wear a mask to help keep everyone safe. So remember right now, only people who work at the airport and passengers who are flying that day are allowed to enter the terminal buildings. I think we also have some other cool stuff as well. Like we have a chamber that people can walk through and they're sprayed with disinfectant, lightly sprayed with disinfectant and all these ways that we're keeping passengers and our staff safe um, while we get through this pandemic. Exactly, and that disinfectant, this disinfectant corridor is really something futuristic and quite cool to see actually. Cool. So, when we actually talk about the new uh, the new things that are happening on the airplanes, uh, and some of those airplanes are, are taking off at Pearson, like for instance, the inside of this Airbus A350. It looks really futuristic on the inside. It has roomy seats, soft lighting, Wi-Fi, and a very modern entertainment system. And something that's really cool and that Russ is very excited about is a camera on the tail of the aircraft so you can even see what's going on outside on your entertainment system. Isn't that cool, Catherine? It is cool, and I was super lucky to be on one of those planes last year, and I really love the fact that it had the camera on the tail so you could see what's outside. So that might be something that our explorers want to remember. 
Mm -hmm. So did you know that some airplanes even have two stories? I know that Russ has talked about this in the past as well. So for instance, the Airbus A380, which is the biggest passenger plane in the world, it has two decks that's connected with a staircase and was designed to carry up to 853 passengers. That's 853, Catherine. That's a lot of passengers and that looks really, look at the lighting, that looks really futuristic. It looks kind of like a movie theater almost. It does, it looks very sleek to me. Huh, I'd love to fly in one of those. So, yeah, me too. Uh, most airplanes use a type of fuel that's not really that good for the environment. And just like the fuel in, in your parents' car, it's not that great for the environment and, and our friends, the bees, who we've talked about in the past too. So scientists are looking at different types of fuel and really other ways that planes can be powered to make sure that we don't tax the environment more than we have to and we're really helping the environment. So newer planes are really much more fuel efficient than planes of the past. And that really means that they can fly further using less fuel, which means, of course, less pollution as well. For a minute there, when I saw the bees, I thought we were using honey for fuel. No, honey is much too delicious to use for fuel, Catherine. That would be such a waste. Um, so when we talk about those new fuels that the scientists are developing, uh, they come from more eco-friendly sources like algae, plants, cooking oil, or even old food or cardboard. And this type of fuel is called biofuel. Think about biology and fuel, biofuel. And some airlines are already flying with a mixture of regular fuel and biofuels to really lower their carbon footprint. And a carbon footprint is the amount of carbon dioxide that's released into the atmosphere because of the use of that fuel to make energy. So future planes might be able to fly entirely with biofuels. And I think biofuel is an important word to remember, maybe with the train. That might be a good idea, Catherine. Yeah. So let's remember biofuel and let's see what else is happening. So instead of biofuels, which is really cool, there's also something that's um, electric airplanes. So I know all of you have probably heard about electric cars, like the Tesla is the big example there. Um, but right now, we sadly don't have electric batteries that are lightweight enough and powerful enough to power most jet airplanes. But scientists are actually working on that as well. So until that's ready, electric batteries may be a good source for power for smaller planes, like the one you're seeing on the left, which is uh, the plane that NASA is working on, and it's called the X-57 Maxwell. Those guys at NASA are pretty smart. You think about they get people into space and now they're working on electric planes. Exactly. So all the big brains are together at NASA making sure that we can push aviation forward and it happens in a very sustainable way. Cool. Another type, of course, is solar power. So they're also working on solar powered airplanes. Uh, this one that you're seeing right now is called the Solar Impulse 2, and it's got cool solar panels on the wings that really turn that sunlight into energy to then propel the, the aircraft forward. So that's really cool to see uh, all those fuels, uh, those solar cells on top of the wings. Yeah, you can see that they're a different kind of wing shape than other um, airplanes. And I guess they need more surface to get all that sunlight onto the wings. Exactly. So the more surface they have to cover with those solar cells, the more power they can generate. Super exciting. Really exciting stuff. So. If you've watched any movies or futuristic TV shows, uh, you might have seen some flying cars going around. I, I was a bit sad. I hope by 2020 we would have had something like that now. But companies are working on what's called air taxis. So that could be similar to flying cars. And they could be very small, electric, and they could help people move short distances. For instance, from one side of the city to the other side of the city. Uh, this isn't a real picture yet. And air taxis are just an idea, but they are working on it. So, I, Catherine, would, would you would you feel comfortable flying in an air taxi? I'm not too sure just yet. Just say I don't want to be the first person in it. Right. I'm very sure that they're working on making sure that everything's nice and safe and organized before uh, they're really implementing all of these ideas, right? Uh, absolutely. But I'm wondering who's the driver going to be? 
Yeah, and that's a big question. So if we want them to be light enough, it might even be that they're um, piloted remote controlled, which would be very cool too. Cool. So what is this type of aircraft that you're seeing on the picture here? It looks definitely completely different than the airplane that we're thinking about in our head. So this is a new type of airplane that's called a blended wing body. And some designs even have passengers sitting inside of the wings instead of on the middle of the plane. And this design has less drag and weight, so it needs less fuel to create thrust. And if the words drag, weight, and thrust sound familiar, uh, we did do uh, a camp about weather and the science of aviation that really talks about those four forces. And uh, you can really do a refresher and have a look at that previous camp to really get a better understanding of how planes fly and what forces are involved. That looks like something out of Star Wars. Yeah, it looks very futuristic and very strange, isn't it? Um, and they're not always thinking about new ideas, but maybe some ideas are making a comeback as well, like a floating airship, for instance. They're like big blimps. Several companies are working on giant airships that could help move passengers and heavy materials around. So airships use helium to float, just like a balloon. And uh, these were actually very popular about 90 years ago, but they stopped building them because they were very unsafe and very expensive to make. But with newer technologies, they of course are making them safer and cheaper, and airships could actually make a comeback. So on the top there, you see one of those older ones, and on the bottom, one of those new futuristic ones that they're actually working on. I think they would be, would they be um, as fast as planes or would they be, be a little bit slower? I think they might be a little bit slower, Catherine, because it doesn't, they don't look as streamlined as the other planes do to me. Yeah, I can imagine, but it sure would be fun to be on one of those. Mm -hmm. Like, just imagine sightseeing out of one of those would be fantastic. Yeah, that's cool. So supersonic is another word that you might have heard when we talk about the future. And that means a plane that can fly faster than the speed of sound. So really, really fast. And in the 1970s, there was a supersonic jet that was called the Concorde that could carry passengers across the Atlantic Ocean in less than half the time it takes now. So that's really, really fast. If you think about uh, 50 years ago, they could fly across the Atlantic in half the time we currently do. And what's really cool is that Concorde plane even visited Pearson in 1979 and for a few years after. But sadly, airlines stopped using it because it used a lot of fuel, so it wasn't very environmentally friendly. And it was really loud uh, because those Concords to fly supersonic, they actually made a big boom to break the sound barrier. But now there's companies that are researching how to make these planes cheaper, quieter, and we might see them come back within maybe the next 10 years. So on the picture on the right, Catherine, you're seeing that Concorde flying over Pearson in about 2003 for the last time. Yeah, and part of your job is to make sure that, you know, we're, we're keeping, we're looking at ways to manage noise at the airport. So we certainly do, we don't want um, noisy airplanes. But Case, um, the one thing I noticed is, I guess a blimp couldn't go supersonic just because of its sheer shape, right? Yeah, and just the power that would be required to get something that big to supersonic would be immense. Like if you compare the size of that blimp and the shape of it to this Concorde, the Concorde is very pointy looking in the front and very sleek. So it's definitely two different designs. Yeah, and I think we should remember, I love that word, supersonic. So that's mm -hmm. something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember. Good, so supersonic, and that means faster than the speed of sound. So when we talked about remote control piloting those those air taxis another thing that you've probably already seen and you might even own one yourself is a drone and a drone is a type of flying vehicle that doesn't have a pilot and it's usually remote controlled like a remote controlled toy so some companies like amazon already use drones to deliver small packages but in the near future it might be possible to even have them deliver bigger things which would be quite a sight to see That'd be kind of cool to get your like pizza delivered by a drone. Yeah, and it's it's like hovering in front of your door when you open your doorbell. That would be kind of neat. But you know what? Drones are not they're not really good to fly near the airport, are they? No, that's a really good point, Catherine. It's actually really unsafe to fly your drone close to the airport 
because they might get sucked into uh, to an aircraft's engine or they might collide to an aircraft. So when you play with the drone, always make sure that you're allowed to fly where you're flying and that you're far enough away from the airport. That's a good safety tip, Case. Thank you. Very good tip and very important, Catherine. So when you think about remote control and all these new futuristic things, who's in control? So if cargo could be moved by drones, what about passenger planes? Pilots already get some great help from computers on board when they fly their airplanes. And in the future, we may even see computers helping pilots out even more. But if you want to be a pilot, don't worry. Experts do say that it's very unlikely that planes will ever be fully flown without pilots. Yeah, and we're gonna learn more about pilots and the flight crew in our November, um, our November camps, because they have to go through a lot of training before they actually get into a plane, don't they, Hies? They do a lot of training because in the end, they're all responsible for the safety of every passenger on board. So it's a very important job. Cool. Finally, one day it might be possible for ordinary people like you and me to travel to outer space. So right now, the only way to do that is by becoming an astronaut. Uh, but in the future, space could be a vacation destination. Think about that. And NASA is working with companies to develop aircraft that can carry space tourists. And tourists might be able to visit the International Space Station. And there are even ideas about building space hotels. How crazy is that, Catherine? Can you even imagine taking a vacation in space? Oh, no, that would be super exciting. But yes, remember, um, we do explorers have um, an interview with an astronaut, our own um, Minister Garneau, who was uh, Canada's first um, astronaut in space. So check it out. And yes, he, he tells a really good story, doesn't he, about, uh, do you remember? Yeah, and I really, really like that interview. I'm not going to spoil it for, for all yeah. of our explorers that haven't seen it yet but it was definitely a really, a really great interview in the airtime section of our website. Check it out. So many people are working on very exciting new ways to travel and to move cargo, like using those drones. But how would you like to travel in the future is the big question. Mm, lots of things. Wow. And I always, I always like the look at the air, uh, what the airport looks like from space. It just looks so modern and futuristic. Yeah, it's very cool to see. Uh, I really like the the nice straight lines. I think that's a little bit the OCD in me coming up. The nice straight lines from the taxiways and the runways. Uh, I always love seeing those. Cool. So let's check out what we learned today. Catherine, are you taking it from here? Yeah, I am. And thanks, Yes, That was like super interesting. I always like looking into the future and you gave us a lot of information to remember. Um, and you know, guy uh, explorers, if you if you missed anything, you can you can see the presentation because, as he said, we're recording it. Um, and tomorrow we'll have it on the website. So um, you know, check it out and share it with your friends. Uh, so now let's see what Russ has been up to. Um, earlier today, he went to two parks in Mississauga, Paul Coffee Park in Mississauga, uh, Malton, and then Danville near the Highway 410. So. Pay special attention because Russ is going to give you um, some information that's going to help you uh, with the trivia questions. So let's see what Russ has been up to. Um, cool. Hi there, Airport Explorers. We're here in Paul Coffee Park, right in the center of Malton at Goreway Drive and Derry Road. Paul Coffee was a famous Canadian hockey player who was born and raised here in Malton. But we're in Malton because this is the birthplace of our airport. The Malton Airport from 1937 became Toronto Pearson of 2020. This aircraft behind us was built right here on the property at the airport in Malton at the corner of Derry Road and Airport Road in the various hangars that were there, which eventually became the AV Row Company. The AV Row Company built the Avro Aero. Unfortunately, that wasn't competitive enough against the American fighter jets, and so the government shut down that project. But prior to that, in the years 1951 to 1958, this CF-100 Canuck was built there. 692 of the aircraft were manufactured right here in Malton, with a company that was building engines also located here. They built over 2,000 engines for this aircraft, amongst other engines as well. So a lot of aviation employment took place here 
in the city or town of Malton, and that helped us with our airport growing to what it is today. We're here at Danville Park in the city of Mississauga. This is the viewing area that was created as a joint effort between the Toronto Pearson staff and the city of Mississauga staff. We just saw a beautiful Boeing 787 Dreamliner take off. I love that plane because of those wings. So that was Korean Air on its way back to Korea. Back in the 1950s, the brick terminal building that sat on our property at Toronto Pearson or in the Malton Airport in those days, on the second floor, people would stand out there and wave goodbye to everybody as they're boarding their Lockheed Constellations and flying across Canada or down to the States. Then in 1964, we built the round Aero Key Terminal, which had nine stories of parking, and people would stand on the top and observe the airplane out on the apron. And remember, the apron is also called the ramp. It's where all the aircraft are parked as they're getting serviced. But then the new technology came along and the security requirements and how busy the airport is. And so our existing airport doesn't have a viewing area at the moment. So what we've done is we worked with the city to build this one. So Danville Park is built on the highest landform man-made in the city of Mississauga. Along with the various plaques talking about the history, they even have these cool rocks. Now you'd wonder why they're so cool, but that's because these rocks are actually part of the original facade of the aircraft manufacturing facility that was located at the Four Corners in Malton. With the thousands of people working in the aerospace industry in the areas surrounding Toronto Pearson, we've seen a lot of change over the years, a lot of improvements, and we're going to see a lot more coming forward as well. We're going to end up with electric airplanes. Airbus is already talking about that. We're going to have improved check-in technology and passenger handling processing facilities. Maybe touchless. Everything will be touchless. And of course, we're also going to be looking at the environment. Everything we're going to do is going to make sure we have a sustainable world going forward. Okay, airport explorers, I hope you enjoyed learning today. This is Russ Crookshank, the airport's roving reporter. Over and out. Wow, so thanks Russ. It looks like you had so much fun once again and when you visited those parks and I can't believe how much was uh, built in Malton before. Planes and wings and boy, that's a very important place in our city. So Kathy, are we playing a little trivia today? Yes, we are. Yay. Okay, Airport Explorer, Explorers, let's see what you remembered from the slideshow he ace gave you and our visit with Russ. I know it's a lot of information, but I know some of you took some great notes. Do Let's remember, do you remember the crew clues that were given? Um, let's see if we can remember the answer. So how this is going to work is we're going to give you 10 questions and we're going to ask you to answer these questions in your head at home. Challenge your brothers or sisters or friends or parents who are with you. Uh, to see who can get the most questions right. This trivia is just for fun, so don't need you don't need to email us or send in your answers. Okay, Airport Explorers, are you ready? Catherine, are you ready to go? I am more than ready, Catherine. Okay. Okay, Airport Explorers, here's question number one. Like I said, there's going to be 10. So here's our first question. What's the name of the new safe cleaning program at Toronto Pearson? Is it COVID efforts? Is it called healthy airports? Is it called masks are for passengers? Or is it physical distancing? Catherine, what do you think it is? I know you're paying attention. I, I was, and I, I, I know that number three and four, masks are for passengers and physical distancing are two of the things that are part of this program. But I'm, 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 I'm going to say it's healthy airports because it makes sense, I think. Yeah, we're looking for the name of the program. So let's see. Oh. It is. It's called Healthy Airports. Amazing. You're paying attention, Catherine. So for the Healthy Airport Initiative, this is what it includes. Let's reiterate. Let's lots of cleaning, meaning wiping down everything. Physical distancing. Lines will have more space. 
masks, as Catherine mentioned, everyone in the airport must wear a mask. That's including passengers and employees and limiting access. That means only people who work or are passenger who, who, passengers who are flying can enter the terminals right now. now so Kathy, that's the Healthy Airport Initiative. Yes, Catherine. Yeah, but Kathy, you went through one of those uh, new corridors. It was kind of cool, right? Yeah, it was pretty cool. So um, what you do is you stop in front of it. It gives you a green light. You proceed through it. You stand there. And then when it's done, you kind of go through and it gives you this little mist. It's pretty cool. It You don't even feel anything. It's quick. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty futuristic. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Here's question number two, airport explorers. What type of plane has a camera on the tail? And I know Russ knows this answer, but I want to know if you airport explorers know. So here are options. Option one is Airbus A350. Is it the Airbus A320? Is it the Antonov 225? Or is it the Boeing 777? So how we say that is Boeing 77 is Boeing 777. Catherine, what do you think it is? There might be a hint in this photo, I think. Well, I don't think it's kind of fair. Yeah, I don't think it's fair because I actually wrote on this plane, but I know it's not the Antonov because we talked about that in the cargo. So let's see if our explorers know the answer. Airport Explorers, if you picked Airbus A350, that is correct. This plane has roomy seats, Wi-Fi, a modern entertainment system, and even a camera on the tail so you can see what's going on outside on your video screen. Isn't that cool, Catherine? It is, and you know what? I mean, yeah, Explorers, like sometimes, not all the time, but you can tell what the plane is by just reading the letters on the plane. Yeah, like for example, in this one, we see that it's an Airbus A350. All air airplanes have, I think, the type of aircraft name on it. So oh. if you want to know, just kind of look around. Question number three, true or false? Some companies are designing air taxis. Is it true or false? Catherine, what do you think? I know you were with HEACE paying attention, but I want to see if our airport explorers were. All right, let's see what they say. Okay. okay. Airport Explorers, if you pick true, that is correct. Big companies like Toyota, Uber, Airbus, and Boeing are, are, are all promising to whisk riders such as us through the skies in flying taxis. The dream is getting closer to reality. Like he said, he was hoping for 2020, but maybe in another 10 years. We'll see. That's kind of cool, but that's a future. Ah, I can't even say that word. Futuristic picture of an air taxi. It looks like, is that, where is that? Is that New York City? It does look like New York City because I can see the Statue of Liberty right on that little island. Cool. Cool. Okay, question number four. What is the meaning of supersonic? That was a hint that was in the presentation. Okay, is it mean faster than a bird? Is it super strength? Is it faster than the speed of sound? Or is it faster than Superman? What do you think, Catherine? I remember I uh, I remember that I I remember that I would remember that and I wrote it down and I know sonic means noise and I know super means lots of. So I think it's faster than the speed of sound. Airport explorers, let's see what the answer is. If you picked faster than the speed of sound, that is correct. It is not faster than Superman. So faster than the speed of sound is the answer. And airlines stopped using supersonic jets because fuel was too expensive and it's not good for the environment. And the engines were very loud. Like he mentioned, it creates a, this boom effect, as and, you can see in this photo. But does, is Superman faster than a supersonic plane? I don't know. That's a great question. We'll have to get back on that one. But I'm going to say I think supersonics is probably faster than a Superman. Cool. Cool. Question number five. What is the name of the new type of aviation fuel being explored by scientists? Is it sunflower oil? Is it extra virgin olive oil? Is it biofuel or is it bioenvironmental fuel? This is a tricky one. Kathy, you cook with sunflower oil and extra virgin oil, don't you? I use sunflower oil and I use extra virgin olive oil on my salads. It's healthier for you. you think they the use airport it? explorers, yeah, let's see what, sorry, what did you say, Catherine? 
Do they use it in planes, I wonder? Maybe in the future, possibly. Oh, here's the answer. Airport Explorers, it is biofuel. So if you've chosen biofuel, that is correct. So flying with a mix of regular fuel and biofuel will lower the carbon footprint for airlines. Remember, that means less carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere, like this photo here. Less CO2. CO2 means carbon dioxide. And better for our bees, too. It's definitely better for our bees. Question number six. What types of aviation technology are being considered for the future? Is it solar power? Is it electric power? Is it biofuels, helium, or is it all of the above? What did we talk about in the presentation, Airport Explorers? I hope you were taking some note. This is a little hard one, but I remember all the, question. Yeah, I remember all the, the there was that there was that crazy plane with the big wing, and then there was the we talked about the. Um, some of the things that the NASA guys were talking about. So I think our explorers were paying attention. Let's show them the answer. The answer is all of the above. Experimental aircraft are being developed by NASA to reduce fuel use, emissions and noise. It will be better for the environment moving forward. We talked about helium, those big blimps using helium. We talked about better biofuels. We talked about electric power. And we talked about solar power. Remember that aircraft with the wings for the solar panels on it? Yeah, yeah. So it's all of the above airport explorers. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, cool. Let's see question number seven. Oh, what was the name of the supersonic jet that last visited Pearson in 2003? Is it the Airbus A320? Was it Boeing 787? Was it a Cessna 172 or was it the Concorde? Catherine, what do you think it is? Oh, I know our I know our explorers were paying attention. Um, I I I I think it's kind of I I think I know what the answer is, but I don't want to share. But I just want to say what a cool looking plane that the the front of the plane looks like a bird. It does. It looks like it has a pointy nose, like a bird. Is there a bird? That is pointy. Interesting. OK, Airport Explorers, if you chose Concorde, that is correct. The Concorde had takeoff speed of 220 knots. That's super fast and a cruising speed of 1350 miles per hour. That's so fast. That's more than twice the speed of sound. And also, if you're familiar with that's known as Mach 2. Did you know that Catherine Mach 2? No, no, I do now. <laughs> That's great. Question number eight. Who is in control of the airplane? Is it the flight attendant? Is it the passenger? Is it the pilot or is it NASA? What do you think airport explorers? I remember talking about this one. Catherine, who do you think is in control of the airplane? We talk about this one quite a bit. Well, I know that the flight attendants have a busy job and it would be really difficult keeping the passengers you know, comfortable and safe while playing, doing the plane. So that doesn't make sense to me. And I know NASA is doing design. So um, I think our um, explorers paid attention and they know what the answer is. Let's check it out. Way to narrow it down, Catherine. That is correct. It is the pilot. Remember, pilots get some help from computers to fly their airplanes. But in the future, we may see computers helping pilots even more. So pilots do a lot when they're arriving or departing at an airport. Not like this guy. He's knitting a photo. I don't think they knit while they're flying, but they certainly always have um, control of the computer. They're the pilot in command. So question number nine, what was built in the town of Malton? This is a little bit of a hard question, so let's see. I'm going to go through each one. Is it the Avro Arrow? Is it CF-100, the Canuck plane that Russ talked about? Is it wings for the DC-9 and the DC-10? Is it the Avro Lancaster bomber or is it all of the above? Again, this is one of those trick questions. Can Catherine, I? What do you I, think? Yeah, go ahead. I, I can't remember specifically everything that Russ listed, so I'm going to have to look at his, uh, uh, his uh, video again, but I do know that there was a lot, so I wish I could say a lot, but but because a lot is not one of the options, I'm going to say all of the above. 
OK, airport explorers, I think Catherine's correct. And if you chose all of the above, that's correct. So as Rush did mention, and if it, there's a lot to remember, and history is not really my favorite, um, but you can go back and watch the video online on our website. But the AV Row and Company was a large aircraft manufacturer in Malton from the 1940s. And later on, other companies made airplane parts in the same factory, like they made DC-9 and the DC-10 wings. So lots to remember and lots to think about. And, and I think the big important thing is, is that Malton was very, very important in, and that's why the, um, things built up around the airport. So a lot of stuff happened, uh, was built in, in in Malton. Yes, because Pearson was just a small farm and there was not many communities around there. But as soon as um, big companies moved to build things around the airport, communities grew around the airport, and that's why we have where Pearson Airport is surrounded by Brampton, Malton, especially Malton. That's where it all kind of started aviation. Yeah, that's yeah, a great is. point, Catherine. Yeah. Question number 10. What is the name of this park in Mississauga? I know Russ was at this park. Is it called Marie Curtis Park? Is it called Roundtree Park? Is it called Danaville Park? Or is it called High Park? What do you think, Catherine? Well, um, I know it's not Marie Curtis Park or High Park because I live near them, but I just, and it's it's one of, I think it's number three, but I, before we get the answer, look at that really cool structure. That's, that, I, I can hardly wait to go to Danville Park and look at that. Yeah, I think you're going to get a great view there. And Airport Explorers, the answer, if you chose, is Danville Park. So Danville Park was built with financial support from Toronto Pearson. There's also, as Russ mentioned, a Paul Coffey Park in Malton, which has an original Canuck fighter jet on display. So if you have some time, you know, maybe go take a visit um, and drive over to Malton and have a look at that Canuck fighter. And on your way there, you also stop at Danville Park. It's got a great view uh, all around the 360 view. And as Catherine mentioned, there's this amazing structure. And Russ talked about all those great rocks, which are uh, were from the Avro Arrow. And I believe there's also a toboggan hill. So in the winter, maybe pop over and see what it's like. Yeah, they got some good tobogganing there and some you can play cricket. There's a lot of fun stuff at that uh, Danville Park. So great. Well, thanks, Kathy. Um, I really always have so much fun playing trivia with you. Um, and a lot of those questions were really interesting. And um, I'm going to look back at the recording of uh, especially Russ so I can just, you know, pick up some of the things that I might have missed. So, so Hayes, what's up next? Uh, tobogganing at Danville Park, but there's no oh. snow yet, Catherine. So I guess next we're going to spend some time with our, our airport knowledge guru, also known as Russ, and uh, he'll answer some of our questions that were emailed to us um, and, and some of our airport explorers after last week's camp that was all about cargo and baggage. So it's time to ask Russ. Hey, hey Russ. Hey, airport explorers. Hi, Chase. I just got back. I'm out of breath. I just had a great time out in the park there. And you're right, it's not snowing, so there's no toboggan, but uh, I was running up the hill, so that was really cool. Um, really, oh, really I, I see you've got, some, yeah, you've got some nice photos there. I like, uh, I love standing in front of those engines there. I had a bunch of colleagues, I think, oh, there's Catherine with me in one of those in front of the engine there. And obviously the engines aren't running at the time, so it's safe for us to do that, but you wouldn't do that normally, right? So no. I get to be lucky and get to do that sort of thing. And there's a couple of other things, photos that are there that were really cool for me to be able to do. The one on the bottom left is, is a Lockheed Hercules um, aircraft in the military. And so that was parked at the airport during the air show, one of the air shows one year, when they had to do the flyovers of Toronto, they have to land somewhere. So because they're big planes, they land at Pearson. And then the one on the top right is one of the snowbirds when they came for the air shows as well. So I got to go and stand next to those planes. That was really neat. I got That's really cool. Yeah. Good. So yeah. we had some great questions coming in from airport explorers. Are we ready to answer some of them? Oh, I'll do my best. Perfect. So the first one is, do some cargo planes have windows? Oh, well, planes without windows are only for cargo. Planes with the windows, I usually think of as passenger planes, but some passenger planes they change into cargo planes when they get older because passengers like to fly on new planes all the time with new seats and new uh, new lighting and all that sort of stuff and the wi-fi 
So the airlines convert them into all cargo planes and then they usually cover up the windows. But uh, of course, most regular passenger planes carry cargo underneath the seating areas just as they carry the luggage as well. I think you talked about that last week where you said you didn't want the lobsters nipping at your toes, but really it's safe and it wouldn't happen because there's a, a heavy floor between the seats and the luggage underneath. Right, exactly. I remember. So a lot of the cargo at Pearson actually comes in the belly of, of passenger aircraft as well, right, Russ? Exactly, exactly. Great. Good. Question number two, how does luggage get x-rayed? Oh, OK. Well, when you get to the airport and you go to check in your luggage or your parents go to check in all the luggage for your trip, it goes onto a conveyor belt because you put a little tag or the airline puts a little tag on it. And that tag is read by the laser. So as it travels along at the airport, we have 33 kilometers of conveyor belts in the two terminal buildings. And so as it travels along the conveyor system, it stops at an X-ray machine. And then someone from the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority called CATSA, they, uh, they'll look at the cameras and look inside the bag on the camera, the an X-ray. And if they don't see anything that's a problem, then the bag gets sent on to the next part of the conveyor belt where it goes and gets loaded by the airline staff into a container or onto a cart and then it's taken out to the airplane to be loaded. Of course, if they see something that they don't know what it is, they might open the bag up. Uh, but safety is our number one priority at Toronto Pearson. That's why we make sure there's nothing dangerous in the luggage at all. Uh, that's really interesting. And 33 kilometers of conveyor belts, that's so long. Yeah, it takes a lot to repair that too. You, we've got a whole team of staff who have to, their job is just to maintain those conveyor belts. That's great. Okay, Russ, how many terminal buildings are there at Toronto Pearson? Oh, okay. Well, we had, um, uh, let's see, we have back, if I go back to that slide, uh, with there's an old terminal, a terminal one, and a terminal two in the photo. So. Let's see, we have two passenger terminals now. So one's called Terminal 1 and one's called Terminal 3. But in the old photo, we had a Terminal 2. It needed to be repaired and redesigned because it wasn't very efficient anymore. It was an old building. So we tore it down and instead we built the brand new Terminal 1, which is in the bottom of the photo. It's also interesting to know that those terminals aren't the first ones we had here. The very first terminal way back in 1938 when the airport first opened was actually a farmhouse that the Chapman family sold to the government so the airport could be built. Then the government went and built a more modern wooden building by 1940. And then 10 years later, there were so many people flying in airplanes, they had to expand the terminal. And so they built it out of brick. And I, that was the photo. If you got a chance to see the video I made today with the, uh, there was a photo of people standing on the roof looking out at the old propeller airplane called Lucky Constellation. So then in 1964, the round terminal building with all the parking garages on top, that was the brick building. Uh, sorry, that was the building that got closed and then we built that round terminal building as a brand new one. And now, now that's gone because 1964 is a long time ago. So uh, once that became so busy, we really had to go and build the modern terminals that we have now. Wow, that's really interesting. So Russ, I'm remembering that if you're looking for terminal two, you're probably at the wrong airport. Yes, exactly. Good. Russ, do all airplanes go to the terminal buildings? No, no, no. Only planes with passengers go to the terminals because they have to go through security and customs. Sometimes customs, not always customs. But if it's coming from within Canada, you don't need to go to customs. But planes with just cargo usually go to a different area. It's a cargo processing area or a cargo ramp. Um, we have several of those on the 4,600 acres of property that we have. And sometimes small planes, which have passengers, but they're special, like very important people like the prime minister or maybe the president of another country, they'll go to an area called an FBO, which stands for fixed base operator. And that's where they get handled separately from the busy terminal buildings. So they might have gone through security when they left their other airport, or they might not, but we don't know. So we send them to the FBOs and then that way, they don't get into the terminal buildings. Wow, that's really interesting. Russ, we have time for one more qu question before we move over to our activity with Kathy. Um, we had a question come in last week and it said, is there a single weather station that all airlines use or do they each have their own? 
so we do have a weather station on the property that collects weather information from all sorts of equipment. And when an airline needs that information to know what's going on here at Pearson, they ask Environment Canada to give them the latest reports from the weather station. So each airline around the world has somebody called a dispatcher in an office, usually near their headquarters somewhere, and they collect those weather reports and then they pass that information on to each pilot who's flying to or from Toronto Pearson or other airports passing over the area. It's a cool job that people don't know about actually. It's an airline dispatcher. So they're responsible for making sure all the calculations are perfect for the pilots to fly the plane. Everything from the weather in the skies, like we said, onto the on the route to check out the routing, make sure everything's good, safe along the way. And then uh, for the amount of luggage and passengers and fuel, they have to calculate the weight that's going to be aboard the airplane. You have to have a special license to be an airline dispatcher. So I hope the airport explorers will study hard, just like if they want to be a pilot, maybe they can be a dispatcher instead. Wow, that's great, Russ. I think some of our viewers had no idea how luggage gets x-rayed and, and that all, not all planes have to go to our two terminals, Terminal 1 and 3. And, and really cool for, for sharing all that great information about another cool job that's called the, uh, the airline dispatcher. So we're so happy to uh, have had these six videos from Russ during all these Explorer Club episodes. So let's uh, have a look what uh, Catherine has to say. Yeah, thanks Russ. I've really enjoyed all the uh, great learnings that you've given us uh, throughout these camps. Um, uh, you're a treat. So as, uh, as usual, um, we're going to try and do um, some activities. So, um, but before we do that, explorers, if you have any questions about today's camp, uh, be sure to email them when you uh, send in your work and, and we'll do our best to answer them um, in our next camps in November. So on to my most favorite part of our camp, the activity time. And Kathy, what are we doing today? Thanks, Catherine. Today's activity is called Fly Across Canada. So let's get our imaginations going. Let's discover and have fun and learn. You won't have time, Airport Explorers, to do this activity just now. So this is a little explanation on what the activity is all about and what materials you'll need to build your paper airplane shooter to fly across Canada. So we'll be leaving you with the opportunity to better understand the activity and the rules and how the activity works so that you can have fun with your friends, parents or classmates. And as Catherine mentioned, don't worry, you can watch this again tomorrow to go over all the steps and you can download this activity on the discover and learn section of this website. Uh, so airport explorers, are you ready to go? I am. OK, cool. So to do this activity, let's understand what this activity is all about. So part one, it's in two parts. Part one is we're going to make an airplane shooter from paper and straw, and then we're going to move to part two, which is we're going to mark out the route that planes used to fly, making a distance chart like the one below here. And remember, the challenge of, for this activity is to see how far your plane, your airplane shooter, can make it on the route that 1940s planes used to take. Okay, hey, so part one, let's build our airplane shooter. And these are the materials we'll need. A plastic or metal straw, a piece of paper, tape or glue, measuring tape, a marker and scissors. So airport explorers, if you don't have this on hand right now, don't worry, this is just us explaining how the activity is going to work. So let's go to our next slide. And this is how we're going to make the straw and paper shooter. So again, this is still part one. We're going to cut a piece of square paper that is about eight centimeters by eight, cent eight centimeters, then an oval shape about eight centimeters wide for the wings, and finally a heart shaped piece for the tail. So if you're looking at photo number one to the right here, you're going to have three cutouts. So number two is we're going to roll the paper loosely around the straw until it forms a tube shape. So you're going to take that eight centimeters by eight centimeter cutout and roll it around the straw. You can use tape to secure it and make sure it doesn't really unroll. And number three, and you can see in this photo again, Airport Explorers number two, when you're rolling it and how it should look like when it's finished. And number three, we're going to fold one end of the paper tube down. So if you're looking at picture number three, you'd see that I folded that little piece down. 
And number four, my fun part, this is the fun part, is you're going to glue and tape the wings and tail onto the straw. And don't forget to decorate your airplane shooter. You can put windows in if you want it to be a cargo plane, maybe don't include the windows. Let's put a door in uh, and you can name your aircraft. So mine would be Kathy's airline. Next slide, let's see what's going on. So now we're going to, now that we've built our airplane shooter, we're going to build our distance charts so we can fly across Canada. So the distances in the chart on the right are straight lines between two points. So for example, Vancouver, BC to Lethbridge, Alberta is one fueling stop. That's one point. Here are the distances between each fueling stop to help you with your measurements along the route you're going to mark. You can mark your fueling stops in your hallway using a tape as a marker or even outside on the sidewalk using chalk. So if you're where I am in Toronto, it's a little bit rainy outside, so maybe not a good day for chalk outside today, but on a sunny day. So if we're looking to our chart on the right, you'll see distance markers. So once we measure out our distance markers, for example, Catherine, if you're flying from Vancouver to Lethbridge, Alberta, that's one stop. If you're flying from Lethbridge to Regina, that's a second stop. And if you're flying from Regina to Winnipeg, that's a third stop. And these are all markers that you're going to be putting on on either a sidewalk using chalk or in your hallway using tape. Okay, let's go to our next slide. So measure and mark the route. So we're gonna measure out the distances from one Canadian town or city to the next. And remember, we've given you that distance chart to help you mark the route. Don't forget to label the towns and cities where planes used to stop and refuel. More importantly, have fun. Okay, so now we're going to go to our next and final parts two slide, which is we're going to take off using our airplane shooter. So standing on one end of the tape of your mark where you've put either Toronto or Vancouver and see if you can make it all the way across the country without stopping for fuel. So you're going to blow on that one end of the straw and then your paper shooter is going to launch. And remember, your challenge is to see how far your plane can make it on the route that 1940s planes used to take. But remember, airport explorers, when you when you shoot your aircraft out of the straw, things to consider while it's flying across. You can land if you land in the middle of the country. What is the closest city where your plane landed? Think about that. What do you know about that place? And if you land off the route, look at the map that you marked. Are you north or south? Are you close to any city in Canada or the United States? Yeah, the okay. one thing is, Kathy, I don't think um, our explorers remembered that in, in 1940s, it took about 16 stops, and that's on that chart. 16 stops where planes had to stop and refuel in order for them to get to Toronto. And how long does it take for a plane to get from Vancouver to Toronto now, Kathy? Do you know, or does Russ? Um, I I think it takes about four and a half hours. Russ, are you still with us or did you yeah, go back yeah, to the park? Yeah, sorry. No, I was I was trying to work on my map on the floor here. Um, and so now it's only four and a half hours. But back then, yeah, it was a long time, long traveling to get across, making all those stops to get fuel. Thank you, Russ. Well, technology's definitely improved. Aircraft are way more efficient and way better for the environment. One quick flight to Vancouver is only four between four and a half, five hours, depending on the winds. So airport explorers, I hope you had fun and I hope you have fun building your airport, uh, airport uh, airplane shooter, I'm sorry, and go explore and have fun. Geez, thanks, Kathy. That was that was super fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a um, an airplane shooter um, after this camp. So thank you. Um, and remember, um, explorers, to send us a picture of your shooter uh, for a chance to win some cool prizes. So here's our um, email address again. It's uh, traffic control at uh, explorer.club. And um, you know you still have ch a chance to send in um, all three activities. So just go back and look at the recordings to be eligible for the uh, final draw on October 30th for a Chromebook. So um, I really want to thank our airport explorers for joining us today um, and for our October camps. And be sure to join us again in a few weeks when we start our camps up again in November 19th. 
Um, and remember at this time we'll be holding them after school. So please tell your friends to join our friends to join and remember to visit our website for more information and to register. Um, and don't forget to sign up to be an official um, Explorer Club member uh, so you can participate in more uh, weekly fun that we'll be sending out to you. In the meantime, stay safe and we look forward to seeing you in, no in November. This is Catherine signing off over and out. This is Kathy, Airport Explorers over and out. Roger that, Kathy. Hope to see everyone next month when we launch more Pearson Explorer camps. This is Chase, over and out. Thanks everyone, this is Russ. I've had so much fun showing all the cool things at the airport and around the community at Canada's biggest airport, Toronto Pearson. This is Russ Kirkshank, over and out.